Don't miss it. Okay, got your Bibles? You're going to need one if you don't. We've got one for you. We're going to be in Acts chapter 26, verse 15 through 18. And I know, you Bible scholars, you're already thinking, wait a minute, Pastor, we've been there. We've done this. We've been over this section. Ah, but there's something here that is so good. It's so important. We're going to go back and look at it one more time. Let me read this portion of Scripture to you. Acts 26, starting in verse 15. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this very purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things of which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by me in faith. How good is that? Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your precious promises today. And we count on those. And thank you that your word is living and active and alive. And it can speak to us right here, right now. So Father, clear our hearts. Clear our minds. Let us clearly hear what you would say to us by your word, through your spirit. And we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you remember the context here. Paul is giving his defense of the gospel before King Agrippa and Bernice's sister and the then governor of Judea, who is Festus. And in a sense, what Paul is doing here is he's giving his testimony of how he has gone from being the chief persecutor of Christians to being an apostle of Jesus sent to the Gentile nations. Now, as we pick up our text today, he's recounting the moment of his salvation. When Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and Jesus called him to the carpet. Do you remember that? He said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And when Paul discovered that this is the voice of Jesus, he says, what do you want me to do, Lord? And it was right there that Jesus answered Paul and said, But rise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you, listen, a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. So Paul's marching orders are pretty clear, aren't they? He's to go out and preach the message of the gospel to the Jews, but also to the Gentile nations, which we knew Paul did very successfully. But here's what I want you to see. Not only does Jesus tell Paul what he's going to do, which is to preach the gospel, but he tells them the impact that the gospel is going to have on people's lives. I mean, in this day and age, we're so concerned with just getting the gospel right that we sometimes forget about the impact that the gospel will have. What should we expect the gospel to do? What's going to happen to people when they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? I mean, that, that's a good question, isn't it? Now, some would say that you become a Christian, you become rich and prosperous. Others would have you believe you go from being a liberal Democrat to being a right-wing Christian conservative Republican. <laughs> Others will tell you, you go from being hip and cool to being square and dull. Casey Walsh's greatest fear, by the way. <laughs> and there's all kinds of other ideas floating around out there of what's going to happen to a person once they become a Christian, once they meet Jesus Christ. And there'll be all kinds of new ones coming as well. See, that's why a passage like this is so important, because what we get to hear here is right from the mouth of Jesus, the impact 
that the gospel is going to have on a person's life. This does a couple things. First, it will silence the voices that will give us a false view of the impact that the gospel will have. Secondly, it should get us fired up to proclaim the gospel because now we know what the gospel is going to do in people's lives. And folks, it is outstanding. And then thirdly, it should give us a reminder of what the gospel has done in us and then we should encourage that work to be ongoing in our lives. So let's see the impact that the gospel has on those who believe. Notice first that Jesus tells Paul that the gospel is going to open the eyes of those who receive it. Now, what this assumes is that the eyes of those who have not received the gospel are what? Yeah, they're closed. They are blind to spiritual things. Well, what does that mean? Well, first, it means that our eyes are closed to the effect that sin has upon our lives. It means that we are blind to what the enemy of our soul is doing in our lives. And, and don't you know from your own experience that this is true? Boy, I, I sure do. I was so blind to what my own sin was doing to me. Now, I could see it clearly in others. Oh, I was an expert at that. I just couldn't see its effect upon me. And then to see what the enemy of my soul had done to my life. He'd walk me down a road that I told myself I would never go down. And I was so blind that I couldn't even see where I was. I was complaining to a friend of mine around the beach one day. This was a long time before I became a Christian. About these hippie drug addicts that were moving into our little beach community. And he said, yeah, a hippie drug addict just like you. I said, I'm not a hippie drug addict. He said, have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> and he was right. You see, I just couldn't see it because my sin had blinded me to what the enemy was doing in me. Second thing that we're blind to are the things of God and the plan that God has for our life. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the natural man, those apart from Christ, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can you know them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, in Romans 8, 5, Paul says this, But those who live according to the flesh, non-believers, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, Christians, the things of the Spirit. For to be fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You see, the natural mind that's set on the things of this earth is blind to spiritual truth. We're blind to the things of God. And in that condition, we just can't comprehend the things that God wants to do for us. We are blind to them. See, that that's the condition that we are all in apart from Christ. But here's the good news. Jesus doesn't want us to stay like that. The design of the gospel is to break into our lives and to open up our eyes to what's really happening in the spiritual realm. See, the gospel causes us to be born again spiritually. Spiritually, we come alive so we can see, understand, and receive what God and the kingdom of God has for us. Helen Keller tells of the dramatic moment when Annie Sullivan first broke through her dark, silent world with the illumination of language. Here's Helen Keller's own words. We walked down the path to the well house, attracted by the fragrance of the honeysuckle with which it was covered. Someone was drawing water, and my teacher placed my hand under the spout. As the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still. My whole attention fixed upon the motion of her fingers. Suddenly, I felt a misty consciousness as if something forgotten. A thrill of a returning thought of somehow the mystery of language that was being revealed to me. I knew right then that the word W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. Oh, there were still barriers, it is true, but barriers that could in time be swept away. Isn't that a wonderful description? You see, in the same way, the Spirit of God breaks into our lives, and our eyes are open to spiritual things. The blindness begins to fade away, 
and the reality of what's happening in the spiritual realm firmly takes hold. It's, it's so exciting. So exciting. In Isaiah 42, 16, God said this, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, the crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. Wow. Oh, that leads us in the second set of things that the gospel does for us. Jesus goes on to say in verse 18, in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Now here's God's assessment of where people are spiritually apart from Jesus Christ. They are in darkness, trapped by the power of Satan. Now remember, th this is not my assessment. Th this is the assessment of Jesus Christ himself. As Zacharias prophesied over his son John, he said that his son John would set the stage for the Messiah who would give light to those who sit in darkness under the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. See, God knows the heart of man. He knows the spiritual condition that we are trapped in. Satan has people sitting in darkness, living under the shadow of death. And then we wonder why there's so much madness and despair in our world today. We wonder how people can sink to such depths of evil and wickedness. Folks, this is the answer. It's right here. They are trapped by darkness in the shadow of death. But again, look at the answer that God provides through the gospel. He takes those who are trapped in darkness by the power of Satan, and he brings them into the light through the power of God. Folks, there's nothing like coming out of the darkness into the light. Nothing that lifts the spirit like light breaking in to the gloom. And that's exactly what the gospel does in the spiritual sense. It throws back the curtains of our lives so that the light of God can come streaming into our souls. In the first chapter of John's gospel, Jesus is referred to as being the light or bringing the light seven times. Listen to this. And John came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now John goes on to say a little bit further on this chapter, but as many as received him who is the light, to them he gave the right to become the children of God even to those who believe in his name. So you get the idea here that God is very serious about bringing his life, which is the light of men, into our lives. He knows that we're desperate for it. And that's what the gospel delivers. And I believe there's some here today. And then darkness has just been hanging over you. You're desperate for the light of God to invade your life. That's what the gospel delivers. But then think about this. The gospel delivers us from the power of Satan and places us under the power of God. And folks, this is so incredible. You see, the power of Satan leads to death. The power of God leads us to life. Satan's power strips us of all that we are. God's power enables us to be all that God created us to be. One of the greatest truths of the Christian life is that God has invested in you, the believer, His divine power which along with his divine nature and precious promises gives you everything you need for life and for godliness. And not only does God's power impact our lives right now, but it gives us the power that assures us of our eternal destiny. Folks, Jesus has conquered sin and death. He has triumphed over them. Therefore, nothing can stand in the way of our spending eternity with God. Nothing. The power of God makes heaven a certainty for all who believe. In 1 Corinthians 6.14, Paul says, And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. You know the most awesome demonstration of power this world has ever seen? It's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But that same power will be at work in the believer when God raises us up as well. And folks, don't you know that Giovanni has already experienced this? 
Don't, he's experienced it. He's felt the power of God raise him up into brand new life. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ breaks the power of Satan, puts us under the power of God. It takes us out of darkness and it puts us in the light. Now along with that, two other things happen as well. Look back at verse 18 again. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by me in faith. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ offers us something that no other religious system can offer, and that's forgiveness of sin. Now, reincarnation claims that they've come up with a way for you to work off your sin. It might take you a few lifetimes, but they claim it can be done. There are religions that will allow you to pay off your sins. Unfortunately, the terms keep changing, so you never really know if you've paid enough. Then there are those that try to convince you that sin really isn't even an issue at all. But you know in your heart it is. But you see, none of them can offer what the gospel offers. And that is forgiveness of sin, pure and simple. And we know the reason that Jesus can make such a bold claim is because he was the one that took upon himself your sin and my sin so that we could be forgiven. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. See, no other religious leader even came close to this. And none ever will. It's a one-time occurrence. And one of the things I ask people that are involved in other religions or spiritual endeavors is, what does your religious system do about your sin? Most of them have no answer for that at all. Because the reality, they don't do anything. But Jesus knew that this was at the heart of man's problem. Jesus knew it was our sin that separates us from a holy God. And so he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He paid the price so that we could be forgiven. And let me tell you how complete the work of God's forgiveness is. The prophet Micah tells us that God will subdue our sins and iniquities. He will cast our sins into the depth of the sea. The psalmist says that God will not only forgive us our sins, but he remembers our sins no more. The Lord said through Isaiah the prophet, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Folks, when God forgives sins, he forgives sins. He takes our sins as far away as the east is from the west. He buries them in the deepest sea. He remembers them no more. Folks, that is unbelievable. And listen to what King David said in response to this. In Psalm 32, blessed, oh how happy is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Oh, David was right. There is nothing greater than knowing that your sins have been forgiven, completely washed away. And then on top of that, Jesus adds that the gospel makes us heirs to the inheritance of those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. Now notice that Jesus doesn't say that we're going to receive an inheritance. No, he says we're going to inherit an inheritance that is equal to all of those who have been sanctified and believed by faith. So who does this list of inheritors include? Well, it includes all the Old Testament saints that looked forward to the Messiah. It includes all the New Testament saints that looked back to the death and resurrection of the Messiah. So that means you're going to receive the same inheritance as Moses and Abraham and David, you're going to receive the same inheritance as Paul and Peter and John and James. I mean, you have been made a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're going to receive a portion of all that is his. And people, listen, if you really understood what that meant, you'd be doing cartwheels up and down these aisles. As hot as it is, you'd still be doing them. I mean, if you think having Ed McMahon show up at your doorstep with a publisher's clearinghouse check would be exciting, oh, folks, it is nothing compared to when you step into eternity and you realize 
that you share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ. And it's yours to enjoy not just for 60 or 70 years, but for all eternity. It's going to blow your mind. And again, do you know that Giovanni is experiencing this right now? He's experiencing this right now. He knows the reality of it. And the great thing is our inheritance doesn't just start when we get to heaven. Our inheritance in Christ starts right now. The peace of Jesus. It's, it's ours. Right now. His love. His joy. They are ours in abundance. We've been given His divine power. His divine nature. His great and precious promises. They are ours right now. They're in your account. You can draw on them right now. Now, we've been given the fullness of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. Folks, the list goes on and on of what is yours in Christ. And they're yours now, available to you today. It's the most wonderful thing. And it all comes to us because of the gospel. It's all part of the good news that's bound up in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a couple questions as we close off this morning. First, do you know anyone that's in need of what the gospel offers? Do you know anyone that needs to have their eyes open to spiritual things? Do you know anyone that needs to go from darkness to light? Do you know anyone that needs to be snatched out of Satan's kingdom and placed in the kingdom of God? Do you know anyone that needs to be forgiven of their sins and made a trial? Do you know anyone like that? Then if you do, then get them the gospel. Get it to them. Be creative. Get the love and the person of Jesus Christ to those around you. Folks, it's what the world needs more than anything else right now. They need the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. The second question I have is for you. If you're a believer here this morning, is the gospel still having the impact on your life? that Jesus designed it to have? Are your eyes being continually open in the spiritual realm? Are you growing, learning in your relationship with God and the things of the Spirit? Are you walking in the light as He is in the light? Would you say that darkness is fleeing from your life and the light of God is continually streaming in? Are you living in the power of God's Holy Spirit? Are you learning new ways to slam the door on the devil? and his schemes in your lives? Are you walking in the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of God? Are, are you enjoying all that's yours as a joint heir with Jesus Christ? Because see, you should be. The impact of the gospel should be ongoing in your life. Or is it just the opposite? Are your eyes that were once open to spiritual things beginning to close? Is your interest in spiritual things waning? Are you finding more and more darkness in your life? Are you finding yourself more drawn to darkness than you are to the light? Have you allowed the enemy of your soul to gain some footholds in your life that he never had before? Does he have more access to your life than he's had before? Do you find yourself staying longer in sin, not as willing to forsake your sin by running to the cross of Jesus? Is there a lack of joy and love and power in your Christian life. Folks, if there is, then it's, it's time to get back to your first love. If there is, then it's time to get back to that place for the gospel. It's having its full impact upon your life. I can't think of a better time or a better place to do that than right here, right now. So let's pray together this morning. Father, well, I thank you that you brought us to this section of scripture this morning. And Lord, once again, we, we see the power of the gospel. And Lord, there, there may be some here this morning that they've, man, they're hearing this for the first time and they, they can't believe what's being offered to them. Wow, this is for me. I can have this. This can be mine. My eyes can be opened. The darkness can be dispelled. I can be released from the hold of the enemy. I can be forgiven. I can be a joint heir with Christ. Wow, I want that. Well, you can have that right here today, and I'm going to give you a chance to do that in just a minute. But also, Lord, it's, it's for us who are believers. Is the gospel having its full impact 
on us, in us? Or is it just the opposite? Have our eyes begun to shut to spiritual things? Is there more darkness in our lives now than ever? Does Satan have footholds in our lives that he never had before? Am I holding on longer to my sin? Oh God, have mercy on us today. But Lord, thank you that there's a remedy in the gospel. We can come back to that place where your gospel is in full effect in our lives. It can happen right here, right now, today. So Father, give us the courage to do that, Lord. And then, Father, we think about our world. Lord, our world is in trouble. It's in trouble. The only hope is the gospel. We've got it. So, Father, I, I'm just praying by your spirit. Lord, this, this can't be our mind. can't be our intellect. can't be our reasoning. It's got to be a work of your spirit that says our world needs the gospel. And I'm the delivery system. God, would you just, would you set us on fire today, Lord? Could you do that, God? Could you set us on fire? Could you open our eyes to the true condition of our world and what our world needs? And that we've got the answer. God, could you just move us out of our little comfort zones and actually make us your people on fire for you in our world? Jesus, I believe you can. I believe you will. So do that, Lord, right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's stand together.